And we are back into our series on the life of King David. So we're in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2 is where we're going to begin uh, today. Uh, we enter today into a new phase in David's life as we move into 2 Samuel, a book which we can divide into, <laughs> into two portions. There's chapters 1 through 10. These are David's triumphs. And then there's chapters 11 through 24, and these are David's troubles. And you'll notice, uh, as is the case with most lives, the troubles last longer than the triumphs. In chapter 1, we have the report of the death of David's nemesis and the first king of Israel, who was Saul. And this is followed by David's lament over the death of Saul and especially over the death of Saul's son, Jonathan, who was his close friend. David does not in any way gloat over Saul's demise, nor does he act to take any personal advantage respecting the now vacancy on the throne of Israel. So let's pick up the reading, 2 Samuel 2 verse 1. Then it came about afterwards that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to one of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. So David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelite, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the, uh, the Carmelite. And David brought up his men who were with him, each with his household, and they lived in the cities of Hebron. So David, uh, <coughs> in the next, uh, then it says that, then the men of Judah came over. This is important. The men of Judah came, and there anointed David king over the house of Judah. Okay, big deal. David is here, made king over, not the entire nation, but over the tribe of Judah, his own family's tribe. But there were 12 tribes of Israel, right? What about the other 11 or so? What were they doing in the way of a king? Well, verse 8, Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth. Say that with me. Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. Uh, he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, even over all Israel. Well, why don't you just say that? So the kingdom <laughs> is uh, temporarily split, okay? That's the situation we've got. Judah aligns with David, and the rest of Israel aligns with this son of Saul, Ishbosheth. Um, and then the first verse of chapter 3 makes a long story short. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew steadily stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. And then the bottom dropped out on Ishbosheth when his chief general, Abner, uh, got fed up working with Ishbosheth and uh, defected to the side of David. Well, this was a real problem. The handwriting was really already on the wall, especially now. And in chapter 4, Ishbosheth is murdered by his own men. And then the expected occurs. Well, what is the expected? We read of it in 2 Samuel 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be ruler over all Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. And then they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So there you go. Not a bad career for David. David would have been the cover boy for Success Magazine in his day. He was, in fact, the most successful and popular man probably in the history uh, of Israel. But he arrived at the top of the ladder in a way that rather rebukes the ambitious man or woman of the world. So I wonder, you don't need to answer this out loud, but answer to you, are you ambitious? <laughs> are, you, are you ambitious? Now, many years ago, if you'd asked me that question, I would have said, why, yes, I'm ambitious. My mother taught me to be <laughs> ambitious, and by that I mean she taught me to set my goals high and then to work hard to achieve those goals. And if that is all that ambition meant, then it would be swell. But one of uh, Webster's definitions of that word ambition is the ardent desire for rank, fame, or power. 
Hmm. The ardent desire for rank, fame, or power. Now that spells trouble. Ambition in the negative sense is the craving for higher status that is rooted in selfishness and often leads us engaged in unloving actions designed to obtain the goal that we have set for ourselves. Lady Macbeth, for example, she was ambitious. Hitler was ambitious. It is a lust for the top rung. David reached the top rung. Did he get there through ambition? No, no, no. And this is what makes him remarkable. David did not set his heart on being the king. Never. We, we see not an ounce of ambition in the man. Doors swung wide open for David, inviting him to come and, and simply take the throne. But he does not seek it out. What had to happen? Well, the men of Judah... First of all, they come to him and ask him to be their king. Then Ishbosheth dies. And what does David do at, at that point? March into his territory and say, okay, guys, here I am. Make me king of all Israel. No, no, David doesn't do that. All Israel comes to David and says, okay, we're ready for you to be our king too. My readings in the history of our own country indicate that this is kind of how George Washington landed in the position of being our first president. He didn't campaign for the job. He was asked. Unfortunately, <laughs> our system of elections, you know, and, and democracy, by the way, to whatever extent we have a democracy, democracy, by the way, uh, like all systems of government, is very flawed because it's all systems of government run by human beings, right? I think it was Winston Churchill who said that democracy is the worst form of government imaginable, except for all the others, you know. Uh, <laughs> He also said the greatest argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. He had a lot of interesting things uh, to, to, to say. But uh, our system of government as it is, unfortunately, um, you know, being based upon election, invites into leadership many of our most selfishly overeager and ambitious people. You think about it, it's like, how many people sit out there and go, you know, what is my, uh, what, is, what is the appropriate job for me in life? Leader of the free world. Yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> it's, it's almost like we're inviting people who are a little too caught up with themselves to apply for these positions, and that, of course, isn't true with all of them, but with probably most. So, listen, David obtained advancement in the right way. God exalted him. He did not plot. He did not scheme to get ahead. He would not tear down those on the higher rungs above him. He was different in that way. David obtained glory the same way the Lord Jesus did, not by seeking it directly, but by seeking what? Now, we've already quoted Psalm 27, 4, where he talks about what he's going to seek, right? You've read the Psalms. What did David seek? I'm going to suggest he sought the favor of God through humble obedience to David becoming king. Oh, that was just a nice little extra. He said, say it together with me, one thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Now, don't memorize that because that's New American Standard. Okay, you got to memorize the ESV, uh, you know, to, to, get it, to get the North Park Church version, right? But the throne, <coughs> the point is the throne was not David's goal. Knowing God, worshiping him, delighting him, yeah, that's, that's what it seemed to be. So David sought first the kingdom of God, and everything else was simply added unto him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One other thought on this. David was not ambitious to be king because, hey, he was content to be a shepherd. He was content to serve the Lord as a shepherd. You see, ambition at least in the negative sense, it's a child of discontentment. People think, if only I get that position, then I'll be happy. They grab for the externals that they think will bring them joy. But God-centered people, which we want to be, have a source of joy that rises up from within. David was a happy king only because he was a happy shepherd. Don't, don't think a better position, more money, new house is going to turn your life from being a drag to being a joy. You know, single people think, well, if only I can get married, find a husband, find a wife, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll be happy. <laughs> married people think, <laughs> well, <laughs> married people often, often see their marriage 
as, as an obstacle to their happiness. And, and they think, I'd be happy if I were married to, I don't know, someone better. Truth is, unhappy singles normally become unhappy married people. Unhappy poor people become unhappy wealthy people. Unhappy employees rise to become unhappy employers. David said, as you well know, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want, or something like that. Happy as a shepherd, serving the Lord. Happy as a king, serving the Lord. Okay, then it was clear from what we have seen of David's story that things were going (laughs) very, very well for David. And after he became king, they really went very, very well for the entire nation of Israel. Israel. In chapter 5, David takes Jerusalem, and then he makes Jerusalem his capital city, and then they win a great victory over those pesky Philistines. National morale is at an all-time high. The shekel is strong on international markets. David, oh yeah, David is on a roll. Then we come to chapter 6, verse 1. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up From there, the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, the ark of God, also known as the ark of the covenant, was a gold-covered wooden box containing the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. It, It contained a pot of manna. That'd be cool. It contained Aaron's rod, the one that budded. This is the ark that sat in the inner room of the tabernacle. It served as the symbol of the presence of Yahweh. Got that? It served as the symbol of the presence of Yahweh. Let's read on. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kind of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. I mean, this was a big day for the people of Israel. Celebration day. (coughs) This was party time. Verse 6. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Well... Isn't just, uh, this just the kind of thing that earns God a bad reputation? I mean, uh, what a party pooper. And, and what, a, what a capricious, picky deity. Here is Uzzah trying to keep God's ark from getting dirty, and God zaps him. Okay, so let's face these questions. Is our Lord a capricious and picky deity? I hope you know better than that. Let's look behind the scenes of this Uzzah incident to see what we can figure out. We're told in verse 3 that the ark was placed on a new cart. Now, in Numbers chapter 4, we are told that the ark was to be carried by the sons of Kohat. Well, that's getting pretty specific. Verse 4, Numbers 4, this is the work of the descendants of Kohat in the tent of meeting concerning the most holy things. When the camp sets out, Aaron and his sons shall go in. And they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony with it. And they shall lay a covering of porpoise skin on it and shall spread over it a cloth of pure blue and shall insert its poles. The ark was built with gold rings on the corners for the insertion of these poles. Verse 15. The camp will be ready to move when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the sacred articles. The Kohathites will come and carry these things to the next destination, but they must not touch the sacred objects or they will die. Okay. Sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 2 and 3, right? Where God said you do this and you will 
die. Here he says it again. He clearly indicates what will happen if a human being touches the ark. And what was that? That person will die. Now, in 2 Samuel 6, we see that they carried the ark on an ox cart, violating God's word. When it started to fall, Uzzah thoughtlessly reached out to grab it. Whammo, he's dead, just as God said. So how does David react? Well, probably pretty much like you and I would react. Verse 8, David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. There are many things understandable that are still not good. David here has ignored God's law, as had Uzzah. The promised punishment was delivered, and David is mad. Maybe you've seen this kind of thing occurring in the lives of other people in your family and in your realm of acquaintances. You know, God gives these clear instructions. He gives these clear warnings. And, and then the descendants of Adam and Eve disobey, suffer, and when they are eating the sorry fruit of their sins, they get angry with God. They get angry with the Lord, not their own disobedient selves, but with the Lord. God says things to us like, you know, poverty comes to the sluggard, and so you loaf around, and you suffer loss, and you flunk out, or you lose your job, and don't blame God. God says to parents, teach and discipline your children, or else they will grow to be a thorn in your side. But you take a different approach to parenting, and when you reap the consequences in your family, you question God. God says to watch out with how you handle intoxicants, but you think you know better, so you end up in trouble as a result. Don't blame God. In most cases, I think, when you encounter a person who is angry at God, you are dealing with someone who is upset about experiencing the consequences of their own poor choices, and then they make their rebellion more thorough by shaking a fist at the Almighty, whose gracious warnings they have ignored. Now, what was Uzzah's sin? What was David's sin? They did not carefully follow the law of God concerning the ark. They leaned on their own understanding. They probably felt, you know, this is no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. We don't have to worry about this. But friends, when God speaks on an issue, the issue itself may not be big, but your response to God's word, to God's voice, that's big. Is he to be obeyed in whatever he commands? Do we have the Andrew Bonar quote? Good. Andrew Bonar wrote this. It is not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver that is to be the standard of obedience. Now, that's good. <laughs> it is not the importance of the thing. And let me, let me suggest this. You and I, from where we stand... We don't really have the capacity to explain to God <laughs> whether something is important or not. You know, it's like a four-year-old telling his parents what the rules should be. They don't know. We certainly don't know. All right, more Bonar. It is not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver that is to be the standard of obedience. Do you obey God when you think he's right or when you feel like it? Or do you just obey God, period, operating in the faith that your wise king knows better than you? Well, what happened to David here? David, the man careful to do God's word, what happened to him? May I suggest that things just were going so good for David? God's blessings were just all around in his life, and so so he, he forgot something. Things were breaking their way and, uh, for Israel. And then David and his people, they got loose. They got careless with the things of the Lord. They got a little too assuming of God's mercy. They forgot about his holiness. That, I think, is what happened. 
In the midst of the party, they forgot that God, the good and gracious and loving God, is a consuming fire. And oh, how I'm convinced this happens with us. We just bathe in God's goodness, and uh, the tendency is to forget that our good and loving Abba Father is also enthroned in holiness and is a God of awesome purity. When we forget that, we may take liberties that we had best not take. God intervenes in the Uzzah incidents, and he says, stop the party. It's time for a sobering lesson. What's the lesson? It's the same one taught in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. You all know that, right? Maybe not. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So we get this story about these young priests who were ignoring God's instruction for worship. Verse 2, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So this is a double uzza. Now you can imagine how Aaron, their father, God's priest, felt about what God was doing here to his boys. Was Aaron angry? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you've ever been a teacher or a coach, especially a principal of a school or maybe a youth pastor, you discover that, ah, oh, boy, there's not a whole lot of anger that's happening out there that's uh, greater than what parents experience in defense of their, of their kids, sometimes even their guilty kids. Yeah, Aaron was angry, but Moses was there to speak to his brother, verse 3. Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. Good choice. By those who come near me, I will be what? I will be treated as holy. Now, that's not an appropriate disposition for you and me to have because we are not God, but He is. And this is what He communicates to us in so many ways. The Lord erased Aaron's son to say this. He erased Uzzah to say this. He took out Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts to say this. God is emphatic that we not forget that He is holy. He brought Israel's great party to a screeching halt. 2 Samuel 6, verse 9. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittites. Celebration over. The lesson had to sink in. Verse 11, Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And the message there is, when I'm with you, and the ark represented God's presence, things will go well for you. And after three months, the party was to begin again. David got a do-over, okay? At, at Uzzah's expense, but God gives him a do-over. The ark was to come into the city, but this time, all was done as God prescribed. Things go better when we do them God's way. The joy was just as great, but this time it was a holy joy. It was a reverent joy. It was a God-honoring joy. The lesson for us all, in the midst of God's blessings, in the enjoyment of His goodness, take care not to forget who God is. He is the holy King to whom we owe complete allegiance and total obedience. So, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, you brothers that are serving, you can come on down with that cue. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, to commune at the table of the Lord, some applications really strike me as quite obvious for our partaking of this sacrament because we are handling holy things. I've led a lot of Lord's Supper services, 
The danger in that is that you can forget. This becomes routine. Martin Luther, first time he went to lead the Lord's Supper, almost passed out. He was so dazzled by the sanctity of what he was dealing with there, so struck by the awesomeness of what we're about. But we dare not take a lighthearted attitude into communion. It, it's, it's silly to think we come to the table of the Lord without joy, so it's okay to look upbeat and happy and to sing with delight in your heart because you think of what is being remembered here, the provision of Jesus for all of our spiritual needs, our, our pardon, that the washing away of our sin by His blood, the coming of our Savior to reconcile us unto God. So many reasons we have here for joy, but sobriety, seriousness, obedience as well is found in our partaking of this sacrament of the new covenant of God. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which I normally read as we come to the Lord's table, and I'll focus on a little different portion of it as we get ready today. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. A man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So there is in this passage where he elucidates what we're doing in this sacrament, this reminder that these are holy things. And if you are here today and you're not walking as a friend of Jesus, you have not embraced Him as Savior and Lord, glad you're here. But you are encouraged by these words to pass the plate on as it comes your way. This is not yet for you. We hope that someday it will be for you. And if you know today that for whatever reason that your heart is not right with Christ, maybe there's hostility and animosity toward a brother and sister that has yet to be made right for these reasons as well, you might refrain from touching these holy elements that the children of God are invited to share in today. So we'll pray about this as we go to the table of the Lord. If you're here today from a different church, if you're a member of an evangelical church, we're happy to have you partake. You are still admonished to examine your own heart and yourself before the Lord and then partake as the Spirit gives you guidance. Let's pray. So gracious Lord, <laughs> we have read a very solemn passage, one that reminds us that even though we have much to celebrate, we have to celebrate it according to your precepts in the way of obedience and in the way of sober-mindedness, remembering that with all of your outpouring of love, with all of your adopting us as your children, with all of the delight that we have in you and that you have in us, you are still not just our Father, but our Holy Father. Indeed, you are holy, holy, holy. We've sung of that, we've prayed of that, we've reminded our hearts of that today. We pray that your spirit might apply that truth to our hearts, that we would grasp in the totality of your word who you are and love you ever more deeply because we know that your love is a holy love, your redemption is a holy redemption, and you've called us, Lord, as your children to walk in holiness as our Father in heaven is holy. So as we share in these elements, may we do so in a way that honors you, that is good for us, that we might walk out of here more engaged to do your will than ever before. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on our behalf, 
for pouring out your blood to cleanse us from our sin. Amen.